Golf is the, the only thing in golf that doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the person playing. Is this man a one-time winner on the PGA Tour? The point, Alan, is he didn't go Hollywood. You need a fourth? Before we get to the episode, we should tip our caps to Echo, our corporate sponsors here. Uh, and of course, Lydia Ko, the new world number one, is is a longtime Echo ambassador. Michael, do you, do you know my affection for Lydia? <laughs> I, and I share it. Just a charming person and an outstanding golfer. You've known her far better than I. What, what can you tell us about her? Well, I still have her hat from the Olympics in Rio. It was this gorgeous New Zealand hat. And I asked her if I could keep it. She said yes. But... W- one time I was, I was talking to her, I said, where does your power come from? She says, it's from the ground, you know, which is like a really old school thought. And she has beautiful footwork and I always watch her swing the club and she's like, she's dancing. And as I'm, as I'm observing this, I always notice her, her echo biome shoes. Like they, they just, they seem to give her superpowers. Have you observed anything along those lines? Well, you know what the great teachers say, there's only one thing that connects you to the ground in this game. And that's your, they don't say your echo shoes, but in this case, it is her echo shoes. So that's pretty cool. (laughs) The secret to Lydia Ko's success, along with many other talents, but she's wearing the right footwear. So, all right, back to Nita Forth. Okay. So fun guest today. He, uh, it's a he has won on the European tour, professional golfer, has won on the European tour, has won in Asia, has won professional golf tournaments in Australia, and is currently, I think you guys know who this is, but um, ranked by today's Golfer magazine, the 79th most influential person in golf. Um, one behind, one behind, one behind um, Alan, actually. <laughs> well, since I've committed um, the entire list to memory, you know, and had it tattooed on my forearm, that makes it easier, but... Uh, wow, well, golf course architect, great writer, one of the uh, a, the more intelligent human. voices in golf. Well, this is, gets easier, Jeff, because we know about your uh, your design history and your friendships. And does, is this person the um, tournament director of the Sandbelt Classic? Your he co-founder is very, very involved in the Sandbelt Invitational. Yeah, <laughs> all right, that would be one, Mike Clayton. Mike Clayton, welcome. Thank you. Interesting. What's been going? On? What are you? Uh, what have you been doing? Um, well, it's January in Melbourne, so nothing happens, right? So I've been watching a bit of tennis. I went to the Keong Classic tennis tournament last week and watched Andy Murray play Demon Ore. and I watched um, Taylor Fritz, big tall guys. I was sitting with someone I knew about tennis. Taylor Fritz, that American kid, was from California, right? Was playing at oh, um, Alexei Popran, Australian, Russian, Australian, who was. I mean, I said this is the future of tennis: six foot five, long limbs, just smashing it. So um, it's kind of. I, I've always liked watching tennis; it's fun. I watched. Um, Keong was the first place I heard an American accent. I heard Billie Jean King say "grass." When I was like 1960, I was like 1964. I'd never heard an American accent because we we didn't have a TV at home. <laughs> so Billy Jean King was the first American accent I'd ever heard at Keong. My mum took me there in like the mid 60s, probably. So I went there a lot. Watched the Australian Open there a lot. I watched New can play Connors, and so that's what I've been doing really, and playing golf at St Andrews Beach, which is always fun. Clayton plays golf every day, usually, still every day. Yeah, most days. I mean, I, I, even if I go and play five or six holes, you know, park, jump the back fence and St. Andrews Beach and duck out in the 12th hole and play five or six holes. That's, yeah, because I, I just – I've got an old set of Ram, golden Ram irons that I stuck in the bag last week, which is kind of – they're fun. Tom Watson style. Tom Watson grind, they are, with the square toes and high toes. Yeah, they're, 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 so I've been playing with them, which has been interesting. Three irons, like proper three irons. Good. They weren't that hard, hard to hit, hit. really. Are they hard to hit? No they're, no, they're not. I mean, you'd smash it. No, they're not that hard to hit at all, really. And all this modern stuff just dumbs us down, right? Don't you think? Uh, in some ways. Big-headed drivers that are just like, I mean, you hit a good drive and it's like, yeah, so what? But someone said, well, you're driving it well. I said, if I was you know, if I was seeing these drives with my old Cleveland Classic, I would be driving it well. This doesn't count. This is cheating, hitting it with this thing. It's true, but if you saw a four handicap or a 10 handicap, hit a modern driver next to Rory McIlroy hitting a driver, you still realize there's a fair skill gap there. Like it's still quite hard to oh, drive yeah. like Rory McIlroy. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's ridiculous how short I hit it. I might play with these, the old guys I play with, and I think I'm kind of a reasonable hitter. And I go and play with Lucas or you, and they hit it 100 yards past me. It's like, it's ridiculous. Yeah, anyway. So that's what I've been doing. Good fun. I mean, <laughs> January is always great in Melbourne because it's tennis and the weather's nice and it's kind of everyone's on holidays and the golf courses are great because it's the best time of the year for the golf courses. So it's, and people visit. You know, there are people down. Lawrence Donegan was down with his, Son playing the master of the amateurs, so we played a bit. And in fact, he came down for Christmas too. He played the sandbelt tournament, and then stayed for Christmas, and then played Southern, and had to go back to school, which was unfortunate. Probably better in Melbourne than Scotland in January. Um, so, more importantly, how good a caddy was Michael Bamberger? <laughs> <laughs> well, he never caddied for me, but um, he was always he always seemed very competent. You know, I think there were. Um, which is all you had to be, right? Unless you were a squirrel. I mean, I mean, squirrel came for me quite a lot. Then he came for you, obviously, for years. But there are a few guys like that who were great. But um, if you weren't in that great category, then competent, nice guy who turned up and was reliable was all you needed, right? For the the listeners, set the scene. I mean, what year? What tour? Like, when did you get a glimpse of Bamberger? You know, as as a looper. Is this really necessary? Very well, necessary, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember. I'm pretty sure because um, Steve Elkington and I travelled a bit that year. He played in Europe. In fact, we were we were rooming together in Sweden, watching the. T- we we didn't get out on Sunday night, and we were watching the the Bob Tway bunker shot at. That was 1986. Was a, am I right? It was a Bob yeah. Tway mm-hmm. bunker. We, we we watched the Bob Tway bunker shot against Greg Norman in a hotel room in Falsterbro, in, in Melmo in Sweden. We were playing at Falsterbro. Anyway, so um, I think I remember Michael from 1985. He wasn't there long. He, you were riding the green road home, right, when you were catting yeah. for Faxon. Yeah. You came to yeah. Europe for a bit. And I did. I were you in the I open field that year, Mick? In 85 at St. George's, I was, yeah. Yeah, I catted there. 85 or 86, 85, right? Yeah, 85, yeah. Did you qualify at Sinkports? No, believe it or not, I was exempt. I'd made the top twenty on the main list here before, so I was totally deleted. Come on, yeah, totally there. Yeah. The one time, yeah, I wasn't exempt very often. But so, who did you work for there? Uh, Jamie Howell, who was an American. He was on his honeymoon. He was twenty-two, and Royal Singports is you guys must know it. Uh, you know, Jeff, it's great golf course. Uh, we try not to use the F word in, a, in abusive ways here, but I have to share one amusing thing. Uh, <laughs> one of the years they were playing at, at St. Ports, I think it was the year Darren Clark won, so many years later, whenever that was. And uh, Mike Donald, uh, who you guys know, is a great friend of mine. And we were playing at St. Ports, and Mike had never played there before. And Mike's book fan, but in a very humorous and appropriate way. He says, I don't know what the fuck they got next door here, but there's no fucking way it's harder than this fucking golf course. <laughs> just, do you guys remember the caddy uh lauren well you would i don't even need to alan might not but and mike definitely with lauren duncan of course yeah we still talk on um we still me- yeah we still message each other a lot uh, in 1985, uh, I, w- I was staying at the, the Checkers Inn. It was a little motel right on the St. Ports course. And I went out one night for, for evening golf. And Dave McNeely and Lauren Duncan were on the course playing a three-hole road again and again. You know, literally stays light till 9.30, almost probably 10, 10 o'clock at night. And I've been around a lot. And uh, But for whatever reason, I've only seen Lauren Duncan once in my entire life. And it was that evening in 1985 at Royal St. Ports. So just last year, uh, I was moved to write to Lauren and ask him if he remembered that evening. Dave McNeely, I've seen 100 plus times uh, since then. And uh, I said, by any chance, you remember that evening? And he said, not only do you remember the evening, we, we started the evening at, we started the, uh, the afternoon at Royal St. George's. Eamon Darcy uh, gave McNeely and me a lift from Royal St. George's to our caravan park. And we took this back road. And you guys might know the back road. It's very rural. And Eamon Darcy stopped the car to look at a cow with a large head. It's like, how random can you be that I've selected one night of thousands and thousands that you remember that Eamon Darcy stopped the car to look at a cow with a large head. But I shared the story because 
Mike especially would appreciate. That really was, that little story probably captures a lot about the European tour yeah. in that period. Because Duncan carried there a lot. He was he carried for obviously Stadler in that. Remember, he, he dressed up in the plus fours and the bow tie when he carried for Stadler in 83 when he played with Watson the last day. And I mean, Dunk was great. He carried for me a lot. He was a really interesting guy. And I always told him he should have been a school teacher. He'd been an amazing school teacher because he was really smart and he just had a great personality and could explain stuff and had a great view of the world. And he came from, he was a terrific guy. In fact, he's living in, he was getting ready to play golf last week when I was messaging him. He's living in down in Scottsdale. And so um, he's going well, Doug. I wish he'd carried more, but he's kind of done with it. He's fed up with it. I mean, that, that's such a romanticized era in golf, kind of the 80s on the European tour. You had all, all these Hall of Famers coming through and the Ryder Cup became, you know, the Super Bowl of golf. And it still feels like it was a little wild and wooly out there. I mean, was it as much fun, Mike, to, to be a part of it as, as it is for those of us to kind of look back and try and, and, try and recreate it and, and imagine what, what it was? It was. You don't realize it at the time. It was like the Australian tour at the same time when Greg was playing and the tour was flying and Graham Marsh and David Graham and you know, Bob Shearer, lots of great players down here. But, yeah, Europe was um, – I mean, the travel was much better organized by the mid-'80s. Randy Fox was a – Randy had everything pretty organized. We would turn up at Terminal 1 at you know, 6.30 on Tuesday morning, British Airways, and we'd – fly to somewhere, Stockholm or Madrid or Paris, and they'd pick us up in a bus and take us to the golf course and we'd play a practice round and go to the hotel. And it, it was fine. It was, you know, we didn't, it, it was pretty organized, but it was, looking back, it was great fun. And you don't re, re, realize how great that era was until you look back on it. And when you had, you know, Savvy, Feldo, Lyle, Langer, was he, Monty a little later, Elizabeth just a touch later. But they were amazing players. It was a great era. And lots of you know, Sam Torrance and Mark James and Ken Brown and Darcy and, you know, the, the, the second tier in Europe was, it was, a, it was a busload of Gordon Brown Jr. Guys who were really good players. So it was a fun era to play. And the courses were – we play, were playing Port Marnock and Walton Heath and Sangdale and Sean T and um, Foster Bro and Porto de Hero and Madrid. So we played a lot of good golf courses too. So it was whilst you know no one apart from the real stars made any great great amounts of money. It was a great era to be a part of, and not just great players, but like big personalities, right? Like these are these are Hall of Fame talkers and and raconteurs, and I mean, it was was the camaraderie you know that uh, palpable? I mean, or I, obviously you're trying to beat each other, but it seems like you kind of moved in a caravan and there was. There was, there was a lot more hanging out and a, and a lot more togetherness. Yeah, there was. I mean, the Australians all, we were, boringly, we all finished up buying houses in Bagshot just just 10 minutes down the road from Sangendale. But that wasn't until the late 80s, really. So in the mid-80s, when Michael was there first, we were just on the road every week. We would go to the Holiday Inn in London. We, we would check in there. The, the South Africans, John Bland and David Frost and Bayoki and Peter Fowler and Nobolo and Turner, we would just check into the Holiday Inn in London on Sunday night and go out again on Monday or Tuesday. And so we, so no one really took a week off because what else were you going to do? So I played in 1984. I laugh at these guys who retired after three weeks. 1984, we started in the Tasmanian Open in, Mil- in Tasmania, obviously in January. I played 23 out of 24 weeks in 17 countries. <laughs> so, because um, what else were we going to do? So we went f- four or five in Australia, then straight to Asia, and went from Hong Kong, you know, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, India, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, and then straight to. I had a week off. Went and stayed with Jamie Crow in San Diego. We went. Tom and Jamie were still living in San Diego, and Cobra was. Well, Cobra was. 1984, so Cobra was sort of just getting going then, really. You know, he was making some great clubs. and So we had a week in San Diego, and then, and then we went to Europe and started playing over there. That was Jamie's first year in Europe. 
So it was, um, and we just kept playing. So it was kind of wild, really. Jeff, do you, ever, do you ever feel like you were born in the wrong era? Because I kind of picture you, you know, as one of the, as a throwback guy who would have loved barnstorming around and playing with the old equipment on all those wild and woolly courses. Like, uh, twenty three and twenty four doesn't sound any fun. Um, <laughs> but I played Europe late nineties, and you could see what it was. Like, it still kind of was that. Uh, it was just the group, the players and the caddies and the, even the equipment reps and the rules officials, we all just, you're all in a foreign country together, right? So you're all together and you just, everyone would stay in the same hotel. There'd be a caddy hotel and a player hotel and all the play. you'd just go down to the bar and the hotel at some point at 6.30 or something, find three or four people and go out to dinner. It might be different people every night. So within three months, you know the whole tour and you're sort of part of it. It's sort of probably why the Ryder Cup's been so strong from the European side because they're just together. You know, that's not a team of, it's not a tour of individuals. At least it wasn't then. Um, it was just great fun. You know, you'd land on the plane, you'd fly from Heathrow, there'd be 50 people on the plane, players and caddies, and you'd land at, I don't know, Zurich Airport or something, you'd go to Kron, and there'd be a, a coach bus trying to take us to the course, two hours. And once people are on the bus, especially the caddies, they're like just telling the driver who's some Swiss guy, just go, just go, everyone's here, just go. So if you didn't get your bags first, you could the bus would just go, and you would just be stuck two hours away from where you were going to go. Stuff like that, um, and you're getting sixty people on a forty seat bus, and people are sitting on golf bags, and you're like, "Is this really what I wanted to do?" But it was just incredible fun. Um, as good as it is to get handed the keys of a brand new car every week and stay on your own and do your own thing, it's way more fun to do it the old school way. So yeah, it would have been brilliant fun, but I'll take my era. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, Switzerland, oh God, I hated that golf course. I just, I mean, it was, it's the most beautiful place in the world. That view from the seventh hole is probably the best, most beautiful view in golf, looking down the mountains. I don't know, I don't know how many miles you can see from, from that tee. It must be tens of miles down that, but one of the worst holes you've ever seen. And just a hot, just a miserable <laughs> I, I hated that golf course. But um, I was about to go there and not play, just go there for the weekend, just not play. And, like do you remember the uh, do you remember the course outside of Florence? I think it was called Ugolino. Ugolino, I do remember Ugolino. Yeah, yeah, I do. That was short, another funky. Year, yeah, short, six thousand meters of that. Yeah, yeah. Colin Byrne caddy for me there. Who was Colin was a oh. great friend of Duncan's. That they caddy, Colin caddy, he caddy for Goosen when he won both his opens. But I remember Colin caddying for me there. But great ice cream in Florence, so it was a nice week. <laughs> great ice cream. Yeah, I think to your point, but both Jeff and Mike, you know, uh, of course, all four of us missed, you know, the the tour as the tour in the U.S. when it was really the tour. But European Europe in the eighties, Mike, when you got on, it definitely was really a tour. And, and and what you're describing is is golf without an entourage. The entourage was the tour, and the and all the tour was was you know John Paramore and. 50 caddies and 90 players. Uh, that's about it. Uh, a couple of equipment guys, Ping had an equipment guy, but it was, and you know, the currency changed every week. And it felt like, it'd be interesting to talk to the guys who played in the 60s in Europe and the 70s, but it, I guess Jacqueline was a big star, but it felt like, you know, we were playing with some of the best players in the world, which was probably the first time that had happened in Europe. Seve had transformed that tour through his presence and, you know, that those other guys, Faldo and Langer, and, you know, as great as they were, got dragged along by Seve because he, he was just the guy every week. And it was um, – like, everyone loved Seve. I mean, he was amazing. And it, it was he, – he, I'm sure he had his moments, his appearance around he fights and he's, you know, he could get a bit cranky at times. But, you know, there were, hard to imagine how much pressure was on him to being the main guy there. Not every – he didn't play every week, but – Every week he played, he was the main guy there, like Tiger was. You know, expected to win. You know, there's, you, you can't miss the cut because all the people are going to turn up on the weekend to watch you play. So there's a lot of you know, pressures on him that we didn't really appreciate probably, but he handled it brilliantly and he was such a great player to watch. I mean, well, I, God, I wish I could see him play again. What's your best Seve story? There were lots of Seve stories. I mean, the best Seve stories are his shots, just watching his shots. But um, we were 
he and I were in a car, not this happens very often, but we were in a car once going back to the airport or something. We just finished at the same time. We jumped in a car and got to the airport. And I asked him, so what was the best shot you ever hit? Without even thinking about it, he said, the chip at Litham. I said, I said, what about the three wood in the Ryder Cup? He said, the chip was for me. That was for the team. The chip was for me, <laughs> which was, you know, but. um, yeah. That is the coolest chip ever though. Like, yeah. Well, he it played still it, looks like it's going in. It just didn't look that difficult. And he made it kind of look easy, but it was in long grass and it was a bit grainy and it was just, and it was the open, you know, it was the last hole of the open. He's Mr. Green and he needs to get it up and down. He just, he, and he hit it so quickly. Walked up there, grabbed the club and just hit the most beautiful chip. It was a great shot, but. I remember him playing at Wentworth. I was an amateur. I was over there. I wasn't even playing the tournament. We were over playing the British amateur. We went out to watch the Martini. It was a cold, dark, miserable day. 36 holes the last day because they'd lost a day for rain. And the 10th at Wentworth, that kind of, you know, Jeff, the part three where you hit it over, you either go left on the left side of the green and putt across or you go over the pine trees at the flag. And it was back then it was a three-iron shot. And most of the guys I'd watched were just hitting it left and putting 50 feet across the green. A couple of them went over the trees. And Seve just aimed left. He hit this slice. He sliced this three on like 30 yards, 40, 20 yards. around. He hit it and just sliced it around the trees to about 15 foot. It was like, who does that? I mean, it was just the most amazing shot. I mean, it was just like, how did you even th- – one, one, how did you think of it? And having thought of it, what made you – even want to try it and then how did you pull it off you know it was like that shot over the wall you've seen that plaque in switzerland jeff yeah it's such outrageous. i mean we were we were in the players tent off the 18th green and billy foster came in and he said i've just seen the best shot i've ever seen because it what because they missed it on the tv they got the tee shot and the and he when he chipped it in but i went back there the next year I said, Billy, was that really where the ball was? He said, that's where the ball was. Like, it's unimaginable that shot he hit there. And, of course, Billy walked out in the fairway and he looked in the bag assuming that he had the sand wedge. He said, my God, the sand wedge was still in the bag. He's got the wedge. And it just, it's just a ridiculous shot he hit there. Beat Barry Lane. Sorry, Barry Lane beat him, which was, how was that? That was kind of out of nowhere, Barry Lane. Dying a couple of weeks ago, that was such a shock. Well, he was a he was a cool player too. And um, yeah, there were too many savvy stories. Yeah, it was funny. We were playing yesterday. I was playing with a friend of mine, who and I've got a five wood in the bag, and we're talking about hybrids. And he was saying how much he hated hybrids. And I said, I had this beautiful ping forward. He used to hit it really well. And Sevy looked at it and just kind of shook his head. Said, "You can't play with that." That was gone. I had to out of the bag. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> what, what an idiot. Yeah, just because I can't hit one-eyes like you, Seb, it doesn't mean I can't hit a forward. Yeah, ping for you. It was just a look of disdain. Like, how can you play with that thing? <laughs> God. Anyway. <laughs> That's a sad story, but, yeah, I, I can imagine the withering judgment. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I, you know, those – I mean, playing with Seve and Greg at Huntingdale one year, yeah, the, the, the sixth at Huntingdale, Jeff, which, which no one ever hit for two. Long par five, kind of uphill second shot. Out of bounds on the right. Not that out of bounds is really in play, but that was narrow. You could make eight there in a, in a heartbeat if you hit it in the trees with your tee shot or your second shot. So for me, it was just a drive and a bunch of three on up the fairway. And Seve and Greg at these one or two or three on. Some of these enormous second shot long. They both flew it on the green. Yeah, you know, it'd be like, it was just like, these guys are a different level. Which was um that was another good yeah that was an interesting Seve story, eighty three Masters Australian Masters, Seve and Greg and Seve's driving it like an arrow. I mean that's a narrow tight driving course. He snap hooked it off the sixteenth, hit a tree and bounced out the first round. But that was the only bad drive I remember him hitting. A guy called Manuel Ramos was cutting for him. He'd won the Portuguese Open about five or ten years before. This was nineteen eighty three. So Seve had just brought him down for, to, to cut him for him for a one-off week. And he was playing beautifully, but just not doing anything. He just bumping around. He hit the three-wood into the 10th at Hangdale, into the wind, three-wood. 
just blistered this thing to about six feet. Just a beautiful shot through the wind and missed the putt. And I said to Ramos, he's not putting that well, is he? He said, no, but he will be by Augusta, which was 80, 83 when he won by four, I think, when he chipped in at the last hole to beat Watson by four shots. You know, he was, he was, um, that was kind of peak Seve. And it was, uh, and he came down, it was playing Australia every year. He first came down here for the, well, he first came down for the 1976 Australian Open at the, the Australian. When Jeff, the ninth hole used to be the 18th. Oh, wow. And, yeah, okay. And as an apocryphal story, probably true that Kerry Packer, who was the, who was the richest guy in Australia who owned Channel 9, who transformed cricket. And he, his Channel 9 was the first, and the Australian Open was the first tournament to televise every hole, all 72 holes that was on TV, starting in 75 or 76. Anyway, Sebi was down on that way down the bottom of the hill there on the Monday, hitting bunker shots out of the out of the bunker on the on the on the, what was the 18th green, now the ninth green. He was practicing bunker shots, hitting four or five balls. And Packer had no idea who he was, and he bellowed from the top of the hill, you know, he was screaming at this guy, "How dare you be hitting bunker? You know, this thing's not a practice fairway." And Sebi shot 86 and went home <laughs> first round. <laughs> <laughs> well, he played two rounds, but yeah, no one spoke to Sebi like that, no matter who that. I mean, and neither of them had any idea who the, who the other was. So here was Seve getting screamed at by some big fat guy up on the first tee from 50 yards away, bellowing at him for hitting five or six balls out of the bunker. No, nah, that wasn't going to work. But anyway, Seve came back in 78 to play at Royal Melbourne. He played Royal Melbourne every year. The Five years the Australian PGA was at Royal Melbourne, which was kind of his course. I mean, Jeff obviously lives on the course, but Mackenzie built that course for Seve. He didn't know it, but he, um, he built that course for Seve. It was just... Gave him space, but concrete hard greens and much more difficult shots from the wrong side of the fairway. But if you could play from the wrong side of the fairway and hit a great enough shot, you can still play the hole. You, yeah, you, you can still get it on the green and get it somewhere near the pin. And if you didn't, then you he could get it up and down. So and it was you know hard fast greens and it was it was just made for him that play it, more, more so than Augusta even. That was, you know, that, that, that was Seve's place. And he, I watched him play. I was going to caddy for him in 1978 because a friend of mine was his Ed Barner's agent in Australia. So he'd set up for me to caddy for him. But I had an exam on, university exam on the Wednesday, on the day of the Pro-Am, so I couldn't do it, which I should have just skipped the exam. It was of course you should have. That's the most. That's the worst decision in golf history other than, you know, Phil at Wing, other than Phil at Wingfoot. But, oh, my God. So anyway, so I finished up watching him play pretty much every hole, and then he was he finished third that that week. But Hale Irwin won, but and you couldn't get two more different games than Hale Irwin and Seve. I mean, just which was why <laughs> that that last day at Lytham was so great. You know, I mean, Irwin just tearing his hair out of this guy hitting one fairway and beating him. But um, he, Seve came back every year for five years, and he won there in eighty one, I think. But he just played. That course beautifully. It's great. It was amazing to watch him play there. As you surely know, you know, Link Soul is a clothing and a lifestyle brand. I've been wearing it for at least a decade. It's cool stuff. It's super comfy. Everyone at the fire pit loves it. We're believers. Uh, if you go to linksoul.com and use the promo code FIREPIT25, you will get 25% off your purchase. You're welcome. And uh, we're also giving away a $250 Link Soul gift card per episode. So go to um, the Fire Pit YouTube channel and leave a comment from this episode and say how much you loved it because surely you're loving it. You're a golf fan. You have to be loving this. And um, the winners will be notified and promoted on our Instagram and our Twitter feed. So get involved. Uh, we're trying to have some fun. But we also have to pay the bills here at the Fire Pit Collective. So back to Nita Forth. Mike, what were, what were Norman and Sevy like uh, together? In terms of how they played or how they just as people? How they got along and, you know, each sort of represented a, a nation. Yeah, I think they got on pretty well. I think, you know, Seve helped Greg with his short game when he first went to Europe and they were, I think they had a lot of respect for each other's game. I mean, Seve's was much more interesting. Greg was obviously, a, you know, I guess you'd say a better driver, but Seve was probably better with the rest. But, um 
yeah, they were the number one guys in their respective continents, really, and, and they carried the tour for you know for a long time and made it really. I mean, you know, they, they were the ones who dragged the people out to watch. But in Seve, there was much more joy about the way Seve played, especially. I was going to say later on. I mean, there wasn't much joy in watching Seve play the way he did when you were in Europe, Jeff. But Seve played the game with much more joy than Greg, I think. Greg always didn't look like he – certainly the last eight or ten years he played in Australia seriously. He never looked like he loved playing here. He looked like he was always here under sufferance. But Seve never looked like that. You know, he never lost his love for the game, even after the game fell out of love with him really. But, you know, if, if you – I think an, always an interesting question would be if Seve was on the first tee and Greg was on the tenth tee, who would you go and watch? And, um, you know, Seve. Watch, yeah, you watch Seve. Seve. <laughs> and and, and um, same question with Tiger. And I think it's – I mean, I, I've watched Ti- – I've seen – I mean, you guys have seen him play more than I have, but I watched Tiger play the last round at Beth Page in, 80, in 2002, the last two days at Hoylake. And the President's Cup match against the A-band side, and it was like unforgettable golf, really. Yeah, that's peak Tiger. Yeah, you know, if you had a cho- well, it was peak Tiger it was two thousand and two to two thousand and nineteen. So, I mean, he was still the, he was the best player at Royal Melbourne. I thought yeah, he no, just, that was, yeah, was th- incredible. that moment in time. He that was that was a magical week. Yeah, you know, to, to watch, you know, yeah, yeah. I, I think you watched Seve play nine and Tiger play nine, right? But um. Yeah, they were the two most compelling players to watch. Seve was much more charismatic than Tiger, I think, but um, both incredible players to watch. All right, to modern times then. <laughs> we can talk about Seve forever, though. Modern times, yeah, modern um, times. Yeah, let's go to modern times. I was actually uh, – so Alan and Clates, um, today's golfer put out a most influential golf list. Plates is seventy nine. <laughs> Chipnuck is seventy eight. Seventy eight. So is that true? You are more you are more influential than Mike Clayton yeah. in golf, and you're actually both. Donald Trump's eighty six, so you're beating him. That's hilarious. Well, that's I mean, that's poppycock, as as someone yeah. might say. Yeah. I mean, yeah. um, well, Bamberger cl- cl- and I didn't make the list, so you guys are clearly yeah. more influential than us. Well, I, 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 I clicked on, you know, I clicked on that thing thinking, well, this is going to be another ridiculous list. No, sir, I was rather, well, that proves it's completely ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> no. you know, in, in fact, it went Shipnuck, Clayton. Um, I think the next two were um, Jordan Spieth and Cameron Smith. So it was, well, yeah, it was, it was a ridiculous list. <laughs> it was so, but I, I think your, your influence is being underrated because you, you've been a great oracle and talking about the modern game, you've, uh, your, your, your design work, I think is, you know, you've been in at the forefront of, of kind of this more minimalist, uh, approach to, to, to modern architecture. Like I would say you were, you should have been ranked higher, Mike, cause you've, you've become a, an important voice in the whole sport. So don't, don't. Don't uh, don't be too self deprecating, but I think you connect the generations. Like you, yeah, probably yeah. you connect the old generation to the new generation because you never stopped playing and watching and reading and writing and yeah, um, it's probably true. Yeah, there's a lot of people who are just so romantic about the seventies and eighties, like you were just talking about. But you've never been not passionate about the whole thing, so you've seen the whole thing change, and you can explain to these kids today what golf used to be like and connect it really well. Yeah. Well, you watched how much it changed. You know, it's changed. Um, it's changed a lot. You know, it's the biggest question that. Uh, and the, we talk about the game. The game's fine. And we, you know, we talk about golf. We talk about this live thing as if it's golf. I mean, it's only professional golf. It's not golf at all. It's just. It's not that. It's not even that important, really. And you know, how far the ball goes is not really that important for everyone, except you know the be- the best players in the world. But it's important because. You know, those courses were designed to test the best players in the world and they don't do that in a way that they were intended to do it would be my argument. But, so yeah, so that's a big question. The lives thing's interesting. You know, um, golf set, you know, golf set, it's interesting as, a, as an outsider to watch it all play out really. So certainly the live thing is, well, I think we're all interested observers really and interested to see, you know, what, what's really going to happen with this. It's a game of politics and a game of bluff and, Who's going to win? Is anyone going to win? Is everyone going to lose? 
you know, is Pelly going to lose the court case in a – when's the court case, Jeff? A couple of weeks? Uh, these guys know better than me. It's in it's early it's in the always, year. It's always been February. I never got an February, exact date. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, so are we are we assuming the John Hagen argument that Keith Pelly is hoping he loses so that all the live guys can play in Europe? I don't know. It would have been an interesting. It would have been an interesting approach for Europe to just stay on their side the whole time. Um, I don't know. We'll see. Well, well, my, my, perhaps the easy way out for them is to pretend to be fight them, but just hope they lose the case, and then it means that Westwood and Polter and Dustin Johnson, if he wants to go and play the British PGA, can go and play the British PGA. You know, and so all all, all the live guys, if they want, can go and play in Europe. So it's going to be fascinating to see how that plays out. Because now the European Tour has this, you know, strategic alliance, and the PG, the PG Tour owns part of, of of the European Tour, and you know they're supposed to be allies in all of this, and uh, so it's. I, I think you're right that that Pelly would love to have all his guys back. I mean, it doesn't help him to have a, a German Open without Martin Keimer and stuff like that. But um, at at the same time, he, the, you know, the, the PJ Tour is helping to pay their bills now, so it's uh, it's complicated. Yeah, it's why it's also interesting, really. It's just fascinating to watch it. So, and they're coming down here to play in Adelaide, which will be, I suspect, the Australian version of live golf will be the biggest version of it because we're so starved of watching the best players. We never see them, really. Never see them en masse like, like live is going to bring. So, you know, as much as I kind of... I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an equal opportunity hater when it comes to the PJ Tour and Live, really, because they've both them are, have, haven't done Australia any favors. But um, I think it'll be a massive thing down here. I think the crowds are going to be crazy. I, mean, I know people from all over the country who are going to Adelaide to watch, because, because you, know, you, you take it for granted in America that you, you know, the tour is going to come and you get to watch Tiger Woods and you get to watch all the best players in the world whenever you want, really. But we just don't see them anymore. We, we, you know, again, again, talking about the generational span, I remember, Jeff, when you know Nicholas and Palmer and Player came down here pretty much every year because they had to deal with Slazengers. Part of the deal of getting the royalties from all the all the clubs that Dunlop Slazengers sold in Australia with their names on it was they came and played here. So I grew up in an era when you know, it was normal to see the best players in the world play here every year. And we don't do it anymore, so yeah. And Nicholas, I mean, he always talked about the Australian Open is is really meaningful victories. Did he win it five times? I mean, there was a point of pride. And yeah, five or six. I mean, player won it maybe seven or I mean, Palmer won it. A, I think I only won it once. He won it at Royal Queensland, but he played a decent. He, Palmer didn't play as much as the others, but he played here a lot. The Australian Open trophies are pretty pretty impressive uh, engraving on there. I think Gary seven, Jack five, maybe or six. Five or yeah. six, yeah. You know, I mean, Saracen's on it, and you know, there are a lot of great players on that trophy. Speed, so it's a, Roy, yeah, yeah, Scott. yeah. It's yep. a pretty good trophy. Yeah, yeah, it's a good trophy. Ogilvy, Norman, Ogilvy, yeah, Norman. On it. Greg, yeah, but Greg won it six times, I think. Yeah, yeah. Like if you spend all your time in the US, it's just it's quite everyone you bump into is like pretty anti, you know. But every time you bump into someone outside the US, they're a little bit more neutral about the whole thing because of that issue. Because every every tour has lost the best players in the world coming, you know, over the last thirty years. People just want to see the best players play. They don't really care what vehicle they come under. They just want to see them play, you know. So it's interesting the perspective difference outside the US and inside the US. It's quite different. I was at the Dunhill this year. Well, obviously, I watched you play there on Saturday, Carnoustie, but. I drove up from London on – I left London at 3 o'clock on Thursday morning and Huggy said, meet me behind the sixth tee at Carnoustie. So we walk out, I'll get my, find my way to the sixth tee at Carnoustie at one 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 thirty or whatever it was. Roy Mackerel was waiting on the tee for the group ahead to get out of the road. Matt Fitzpatrick no, – Shane Lowry was behind him, were also waiting on the tee. And Matt Fitzpatrick was the group behind him. He walked off the fifth green. And so the three of them, three groups are on the sixth tee and Huggy's bitching about this tournament. This bloody tournament takes forever. Slow play, playing with hackers, such a pain in the ass, this tournament. I said, Huggy, we're watching Roy McElroy play golf. Do you know how much people in Australia would give to watch Roy McElroy play golf? And he said, yeah, you're right. 
stop your whinging. You know, it was like, it was just, you know, it was just, we just don't see those guys. So it was, um, you know, here's Huggy bitching about having to wait for 10 minutes to watch Rory McIlroy tee off the sixth at Carnoustie. You know, one of, one of the best par fives in golf. Dunhill, you know, cool tournament. Rory McIlroy playing golf. But, of course, Huggy sees him play all the time, so he just takes it for granted. But, you know, not to be taken for granted watching Rory McIlroy play golf ever. Do you have a sense of – Greg Norman talks about his desire to grow golf globally through this live tour. Do you, have a, do you have a sense if that is a truthful statement or not? I don't know how, quite, know how to word that. What is his goal? Um, I think Greg's goal is to make money for Greg probably. I, mean, I might be wrong, but, you know, I, um, you know, I, th- I thought you can't, you know, it would be silly to expect a bunch of 25-year-olds to think of this at the time. But if in 1980 or 81, the early 80s, Savvy and Greg and Nick Price and, you know, all those guys, Faldo, playing in Europe, had gotten together and said, let's create a great tour outside of the United States so we can, I hate the phrase, grow the game in our own country. So when let's all go play the Australian Open, let's all go play the South African Open, let's create a great tour in Europe, let's go and play the Japan Open, let's create a viable, a great and viable tour outside of the United States. Then they could have done that. There were enough, that was the only era where there were enough superstars to create that. But you can't expect, you know, 25 year olds, Severiano Ballesteros and Nick Fowler and Greg to, to even think of that idea, let alone create it. So that that would have been, and if that tour had grown and captured McElroy and Westwood and Poulter and Adam Scott and Ogilvy and all of the best non American players, Ernie Els, it would be the best tour in the world now. It would be incredible. Because it would be miles more interesting, and, and you would you know you would go to the best courses, and they would be paying for phenomenal amounts of money, and that would have been a great way to expand the professional game around the world. You could have organised Asia and made golf in Asia better, which has always been wildly disorganised. So it seems like Liv are going to throw some money at it and make it much better than it's always been. But that that was the chance to really create a great world tour. But a forty-eight man exhibition kind of exhibition slash tournament playing 14 times a year, mostly in America still. I mean, how many weeks are in America now? Eight, half of them? For yeah. live? Yeah, for live, yeah. Half of them in, in, in yeah. the United States. No, more than half. They haven't announced their schedule for this year, but I think it's going to be eight or nine out of 14. Yeah, so that's kind of, you know, if, if Greg was organizing that, creating a 140-man world tour, and trying to get all of the best non-American players to play 35 weeks around the world. Not that they have to play all, all – every one of them has to play 35 times. They can play as many as they want. But that would be something truly that would grow the game internationally. But now the PGA Tour is such a dominant tour that all the focus is in America. and So it's, um, it's a pity for someone who played in Europe and loves the Europe, European Tour that – Hopefully, it still remains a relevant, strong and relevant tour. But, I mean, arguably, I mean, we saw how many Australian kids went to play the tour school in Asia this year. Asia might become a pretty significant tour if the live money flows into that and they start expanding that because that's always been a pretty poorly administered professional game. I mean, we played that tour for – used to go for 10 weeks in. I mean, Payne Stewart played – my first year in Asia was the – First year he didn't play. He'd played there for three or four years. And, you know, Bob Tway was up there, you know, a bunch of young Americans who were trying to, Jeff Sluman, just waiting to find their way into the PGA Tour. And part of that was to go and play in Asia in February and March and April. Joey Sindelar and, you know, there were a bunch of guys who went up there and played. Good players. So, you know, the rest of the world needs to get its act together. But I'm not sure that Liv is the way to do that. You know, it needs to be bigger than that and more players than that and more countries than that. And, you know. So it's interesting. As I said, you know, it's, it's fascinating as someone who doesn't play anymore and doesn't – I kind of care what happens, but it's not affecting me. It affects the kids that, you know, kids I care about and, and, and you know, whether they make a living out of playing professional golf. But the, the rest of the world needs to get, a, get its act together and start putting on a, 
coordinated show and try, trying to win back the 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 flood of players to, that, that go to the PGA Tour because obviously that's where you're going to go because that's where the best players are and that's where the money is. But what does it look like in a hundred years or fifty years? The, the professional game and you know, do, do you set about the professional game with a fifty year vision of where it's going to be outside of the US, or is it just dominated by America? Who knows? I'm even five years. The this live experiment. Uh, uh, it has a shorter time horizon. I mean, what's it going to look like in two years? It's it's such a big question. I mean, they're they're trying to piece it all together right now. They haven't announced their schedule. They haven't announced a TV deal. They're hemorrhaging top executives. They haven't signed any players. Like, uh, it's fair to wonder like where where is it going to go? And even in the short term, let alone the long term. I mean, does it exist in five years? Do we do, do, do we think they just the Saudis just go? This is all too hard. I mean, poor. Paul McNamee is a friend of mine. In fact, you know, we were watching the tennis at Keong the other day and he said, you know, the Saudis bought the wrong sport. Because he's a big critic of the way tennis is organized. He said it's just a tennis is incredibly badly organized. I mean, I mean they, tennis wishes it was golf with all the money in golf. And he's a massive critic of the way the tennis tour is organized and how poorly the players are played. Obviously not at the top end, but, you know, he, he said if you're not in the top 100 in the world and playing in the Grand Slams, you're not making a living playing tennis. So, um, well, I, I've heard some rumblings that that there's 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 a, a breakaway tennis league that's, that's trying to get in with with the public investment fund. So uh, they may yet, you know, reshape the the tennis game as well. Paul's view was that all forty eight of the top forty eight players would well, not forty eight because forty eight probably doesn't work with a probably sixty four with a sixty four draw. But um, he said they'd all sign. Every one of them, yeah. Same as the LPGA, really. You, you know, mm-hmm. if you, you know, if if, if Liv set up to destroy the LPGA too, they they would just sign the top forty eight LPGA players, and they would all go. I assume. I think Liv's vision is to partner with the LPGA and and just play on weeks that that don't compete with the LPGA, and it would be an additive. So keep the LPGA schedule, and then come play eight Liv events, and everyone makes money, and everyone's excited to be there, and you know that. That's obviously more productive if you could partner and not compete. Well, to be fair, I think they wanted to partner with the PGA Tour. It's just they don't have any room to. There's just no dates in the year, you know. Like so, I don't think they wanted to be come in and bully, but they kind of had to, you know. Yeah, it's interesting because I mean, this this could be a whole other podcast. But like you know, when Andy Gardner hatched the the Premier Golf League, I mean, that goes back to 2018, and he was. He always thought that they, they could coexist and he was trying to forge dialogue and ultimately kind of this last ditch effort, he tried to give a, make make all the tour players equity partners in the Premier Golf League. And um, but he, the Saudis at, at that point were already on the scene and they had they had more money and and they weren't as interested in partnering, Jeff. I mean, I think they they saw like the, we we could just do this and um with or without the PGA tour. But it I mean, I'm retracing all this in a book, and it's a fascinating chapter with the PGL and what what could have been because that that they really were serious golf people, and they had they had this grand vision. I, I've read their 116 page prospectus that laid out all these different ways to engage fans and and to rethink the entire sport, and it, it's really cleverly done. And um, but of course, the Saudis came in, they hired a couple of of the PGL's top guys, and they just they just stole the idea essentially. And but they did it their way, which was with a lot less finesse and a lot more money. And um, we, we could have be having a different conversation where this this competitor, which the tour the PG tour needs, they've always needed a competitor, right? But it could have been a lot more elegant. But it's not the way it played out. Have the PGL gone away? Are they just are they no longer operating? Or Andy Gardner? I mean, where's he gone? Yeah, I mean, the, I suspect they're building a a um, um, a nine figure lawsuit against uh, the Saudi Gulf folks because when, when you read this prospectus, I mean, everything that's in there, Liv just flat out took. It's not even subtle. They used every idea, every idea. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the fight's over. They're not, there's not going to be a third breakaway league. That's impossible. There's not enough stars to support two circuits. So, uh, I, I think the idea is mostly dead, but, um, uh, I, I don't think we've heard the last from the PGL just from a, a legal standpoint. 
So if the Saudis decided they had enough and decided they were going to buy tennis instead of golf and they went away, would the PGL replace them? They might try. They might try. Because, um, you know, they had, they had money from uh, investors and from institutional lenders and, you know, it was mostly uh, European money, some Australian money. It didn't have the taint of, of the Saudis and all that. I mean, it, it could have been an interesting product. That's that's we're getting we're getting yeah we're we're getting in the weeds here, but it it is fascinating stuff. I mean, Mike, as as we alluded to earlier, I mean, people people come to you for podcasts and to write articles about the state of the game and and where it's all headed. Are uh, you know, Michael and Jeff and I have talked about this at great length with other guests, but are are, are you concerned? I mean, when when you look at it, all the trends from participation to uh, to golf course openings to the professional game, like if you put you on the spot here, like what is the state of the game right now? It's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, in terms of the little world Jeff and I inhabit, the architecture world, I think it's, it's in great shape. I think the last 30 years will be looked back on in 100 years and seen as being incredibly productive. So I think, you know, in terms of the golf course, the, the golf courses we're playing, the, the game is much better. Um, you know, outside of America, it's really affordable. Club memberships are still cheap, and clubs still do really well in Australia. And and from what I can tell, in 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 England, so it's you know it's affordable. It's I mean, Australians look at America and they're amazed at how expensive the game is to play at kind of country club level. How much it costs to and and reversing that. America. I, I played with a couple of Americans last week at. Metropolitan, my home club, and we were talking about what it cost to join Royal Melbourne. It was, I don't know, it's it fifteen or sixteen thousand Australian dollars to join, and then six thousand dollars a year Australian dollars, four thousand US. I think they can't get their head around that. I mean, arguably the greatest thirty-six old place in the world, and it's just giving it away. So you know, it's cheaper to. I mean, COVID was the best. You know, for all the silly grow the game initiatives and how much money got spent on growing the game through all these wild ideas. COVID did a better job than any of them in growing the game because what else are we going to do but play golf? So it's, um, you know, the courses are great. The, the professional game, there's lots of money in the professional game and people are still interested in it. Amateur golf still going well. Public golf has never been better. So it's, um, yeah, I think the game's in great shape because it's ultimately it's a great game. It's a cool game to play. It's good fun. It's, you, know, you play with wildly disparate group of people, and who all tend to love playing it. Not 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 all of them, but most of them love playing. And you know, it's a great game to travel with. It's a, it's the best it's the best game to travel with. You, you go to all these amazing places around the world. You know, you, you play tennis. I mean, a tennis court's a tennis court. Unless you're on the centre court at Monte Carlo, which is a pretty cool place, or Wimbledon or something. A tennis court's a tennis court, but. You know, there are so many amazing places to play golf that that's the one great attraction of the game is the, the places that we play it. And you can go anywhere and find anyone on the first tee and have a, have a cool game because you, you, you're kind of bonded with this common affection for the crazy game. So I think it's doing fine. You know, there's, there's um, you know, golf in newspapers is sort of dead. No one buys newspapers to read golf anymore. But there's never been better or more great golf riding to be accessed. You just need to be on. You know, I see these old guys that go. You know, that, that they lament the fact that there's no golf on, you know, newspapers anymore. As if we're going to go back to the 1970s. But you ask them if they're on Twitter. Of course, they're not on Twitter because they've barely heard of it. But you can read everyone on Twitter. You know, you, I mean, there's more access to great golf riding now than ever. Just. Get on Twitter and follow all the guys who put great golf content up there. There's so much golf to read now; it's amazing. So it's um, the guy the game's in great shape, really. Yeah, you know, the only thing is the ball goes too far for the best players, so the courses don't play the way they should. And so once the administration gets their heads around that, then the game will be even better off. Because I think it's in you know I I, I kind of like the era Jeff when. Bill Rogers was hitting a three iron to the last hole of Victoria to win the Australian Open. I mean, Greg, in fairness, Greg hit a nine iron that day. Last hole of Victoria is an up and over the hill, four hundred and sixty-four meter 
par five with a tee that's 10 yards further back than when Bill Rogers played it in 1981 when he won the Open there. That was a really good hole when it was a driver three iron. It's not very interesting when it's a driver nine iron. So the game is more interesting when you know, it asks more of the second shots. But once we get around that, the game will be, will be perfect because it's such a great game. It's an amazing game. You know, and it spawned, you know, I mean, I we were talking about Michael's book, The Green Road Home. It spawned some, and, and so many others, you know, it spawned so much great writing. It's a really, it's a great game to read about. I mean, people don't read enough golf, you know, which I think we would all agree that I think that there are lots of people who play golf and they take out of the game what they personally want out of the game. And that, which is fine. That's kind of its purpose. But they would never read a book about golf. To, to, to think to read a book about golf, and there are so many great golf books that are so much fun to fun to read about. I mean, Tom Callahan's book. There's that great picture of you, Jeff, reading Callahan's book on Arnie, which was an amazing book. It was such a brilliant book. I mean, such a such a fun ride. Just read great golf writing about someone who was a compelling figure, and you know, it's um. There's so many great books to read about golf, even if you don't play it. I mean, Mike and I bonded over um, Australian sports writer Jeff Roach told me that the best sports book ever written was A Handful of Summers by Gordon Forbes. So I went and bought it in Lily White's in London, which I don't know if Lily White still exists. It was one of the great sports stores of the world, I think. But it, that, he said, you know, to, he told me if I went in there, I'd find a copy of it. And sure enough, it was in there. And I lent it to Frank Novello and never got it back, which was always a great lesson. And never lend books. <laughs> um, so I had to buy another copy. But, I mean, that was a great sports book, just, just, just a brilliant sports book. But there's so much great golf writing that even if you didn't play golf, you could read about golf and just love it because the writing is so great. The smaller the ball, the better the writing, right? Yeah, that was George Plimpton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, only might because so many of uh, of our listeners maybe won't even know the name. If they do know the name, they won't know how to spell it, and they really don't know anything about the man, his accomplishments, his personality. But you're just old enough to have known Peter Thompson, and I'm wondering if you could 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 he, could he just give us a short biographical sketch of what an extraordinary man he was, both as a golfer and a politician and as a person in the game. It was no short one. Um, I was walking. What was I watching? The, maybe the Sandbolt tournament. Jeff, I can't remember. Um, with Andrew, his son, and we got to talking about because Thomas. No one made the game look easier than him ever. He looked like he was just playing a Saturday afternoon four ball in a tournament. It was amazing. I said, you know, was was it was the game simple for your dad because the way he thought about it, or was the way he thought about it? so simple because of he just stumbled upon a really simple way to play it. And he said, you know, he said, and I never knew, his, his dad just disappeared. He was, uh, he, at the time he was an only child, his father disappeared during the Depression to go and make some, earn a living. And his mother divorced eventually for desertion which was at grounds for divorce back then because that was in the era in Australia before no-fault divorce. You, you, you had to have a reason to divorce someone and desertion was a reason to divorce someone. So he said he grew up with nothing, poor, started playing golf on a public course and just found balls and hit a ball around. And, but he, he always had a, he had a great mind for golf. He, was, he, he played it so beautifully and simply and thought about it so simply. But he, um, I've, my dad took me to Metropolitan to watch the Australian PGA in 1967, I think. I was there for a couple of years, 67 and 68. And he sort of walked in there and he said, there's Peter Thompson, he's the best player here, we'll go and watch him. So I didn't have any idea what I was watching, but I watched him and he was kind of my hero from that day on really. And you know, I watched him, I, I took up golf a year later and went down to watch him play every chance I could when he played the Sam Belton, played the tournaments in Melbourne. And the first Vic Open I played in, I, Yarra Yarra, I played with him in the third round. I was like, God, I was so nervous playing with Peter Tom. I couldn't believe it. And he hit this drive out of the neck on the second hole at um, 
Yeah, yeah, we're just straight into those cypress trees, left of the teeth. Couldn't believe it. Like, how does someone like that hit a shot like that? But he was, um, and I grew up reading him. I mean, he wrote in the age most weeks. So his writing was, you know, I, at the time I disagreed with most of the things he was writing about, only to realise as I grew up and learned a bit about golf that I was completely wrong almost every time and he was completely right about everything he was saying about the game. And So he, he was incisive, he was controversial, he was a beautiful writer, He's, he thought about the game on a different level. And he was the, and he's talking about the world tour, he was the, he was the one who, really tried to instigate the world tour. He was the one who was writing about a tour outside of America because he realised the game needed to provide more jobs for more players. So he essentially set up and started the Asian tour and he went and played in Japan a lot. He played in Europe a lot and he played a lot in Australia, obviously. And he was the main guy in the in the 60s. He was the main guy. He took no appearance, man. He, just, he played because he realised that the game had to develop and he, him as the, the the most important non-American player around the world, it, it was fell on him to kind of pull it together, which he did. You know, he, he, he walked the walk and he, you know, he and Kel Nagel were incredible. But, uh, you know, brilliant mind, simple, great writer, um, beautiful player. Only, and he would turn up to, now, uh, Jeff, I'm sure you were at, pennant dinners of Victoria where he would come and speak to the pennant team and he would turn up at dinners and lunches and just speak just because he when it was it gave any kind of event that had no right to be important kind of gravitas because he was there he kind of dangerous with his presence almost in a positive way not not like it was you know, he would just turn up and just be Peter Thompson which was just be really cool and talk about golf and great speaker funny you know deprecating self-deprecating, played played down what he did, but he knew what he'd done was important. You know, he, he had a great sense of, without being boastful, he had a great sense of his importance in the game and who he was and he always, you know, his legacy was incredible really. When he when he won the, the Australian Open in 1972, how, he was in his mid-50s, right? No, 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 he was 42. He was 1929. He was the same year as Arnold Palmer. Oh, you're right. Nine, okay. Nine, 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 nine. twenty-nine. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so he was. So I remember him writing. You know, and forty-two when you, I was. Uh, you know, how old was I? No, twenty seventy-two. I was fifteen, sixteen. So forty-two seems like ancient. You know, he was an old man, right? <laughs> of course, he wasn't old at all. But and he wrote about when he won. He wrote about you know obviously there was more pressure on David because in truth the, this was a much more important tournament for him to win than it was for me. So he was playing it down, but it, um, he had a beautiful shot into the 72nd hole. He was one behind. He hit a seven iron to a foot, just a beautiful shot, which was into the last at Kionga, which was a short par four. He bumped a three-wood off the tee and hit a beautiful shot. But the, the, the famous story of the playoff, of course, stupidly and unimaginably, now there was an 18-hole playoff on Monday, which was televised. So... Peter had probably gone to Royal Adelaide, which is just around the corner, to warm up, hit a few balls and warm up. You know, David's, at, David's hitting balls on the range at Kionga. And Guy Walsenholm, who was a terrific English player who emigrated to Australia and lived here and played here for in the 70s. Um, Peter was up on the balcony of the clubhouse having a cup of tea and David Graham kind of turns around and said, He's not even taking it seriously. He's not even hitting any balls. What's he doing? Of course, he's probably, as I said, snuck off and hit balls at all Adelaide. But anyway, um, I didn't know a playoff. Peter walked onto the tee and just kind of, it was a kind of a bit of, I guess it was a probably pretty, not that organised or not that, I'm not sure, but you know, Peter just teed his ball up and hit it. And David was upset at um well, you know, we didn't toss a coin. And he said, well, I made three of the last holes, my honour. <laughs> and I goes, David was <laughs> obviously nervous and now he's upset and snap hooks it, having hit 20 perfect drives on the practice fairway, snap hooked it out in the practice fairway and walked down there to find white stakes on the side of the practice fairway. His ball's out of bounds. So he's now got to walk back to the tee. As he's walking back to the tee, 
Peter hits his second shot up 50 yards short of the green and and then proceeds to pitch it to 20 foot and knock it in, made four and David made seven and he beat him 71 to 74. But, you know, it was over even before David had hit a shot really. And he, he would play those sort of – Peter would play those sort of mind games. He was a, he was a great sledger. Is, there a sle- is sledging a word in America, Jeff? Sledging is a – I don't think so. It's a, no. it's, a, it's a cricket game for – Needle. It's needling. It's a yeah. needle. Yeah, needle, yeah. It's called sledging in cricket. So Tomo was a great sledger. He'd kind of throw in a little kind of Lee Trevino type barb every now and then. It was actually clever and quite funny. But, yeah, he was um, – no, I'd love to hear that because he he always seemed like such a perfect gentleman and I pictured him as, you know, a Boy Scout out there. I liked to hear he had a little bit of an edge. Yeah, you know, on that day I played with him at Yario, the fourth hole at Yario was a great par three. And we were hitting seven irons, Jeff, so that was kind of some indication of what the wind was like. And um, the green used to kind of bow off at the sides a bit. They, they, they changed it years later and ruined it and Tom Doak fixed it. But... Um, you hit the edge of the green. It would always kick off the edge of the green into the deep bunker on the left. And I had this pretty good shot with a seven iron. And it just kind of got in the wind and kind of turned a bit left and hit this thing and went down the bunker. And as I was pulling my tear out of the ground, he was walking up to hit and he said, hmm, he said, the wind got you there, didn't it? <laughs> that, was, that was just Tomo, you know, mm, the wind got you there. You know, it, was, it was just a – he was um, – yeah, he was great. He was great because he was – you know, he, it was the way you would – talk to someone playing a friendly game on Saturday afternoon at the club. He just, he never treated tournament golf any differently. And people would get upset at, he, he would kind of throw these little needles in, but it was, it, it was exactly what you would say to a mate playing a, playing a friendly game. He just treated it the same. But, but he was great, you know, for the young players, he was, Norman von Neider had mentored him when he was up to the point where the first year he went to Europe, von Neider said, well, because Peter didn't obviously have much money of the first year. He was there in 1951. And Von Neider offered to split the prize money. Let's just split our prize money, which was Von Neider saying, you know, if you run out of money, I'll, I'll back you. Don't worry about it. But I mean, Peter was six and he's first open and you know, there was no need for him to split his prize money. But, you know, he was um, – so, so Von Neider really helped him and Peter kind of took that on board and, you know, the, the, the next generation, Graham Marsh and David Graham, he, he, Stuart Ginn, Bob Shear, he, he was a great mentor to all those guys, which is sort of what we're trying to do with the Sandbelt tournament, Jeff, I guess, is really carry on that legacy of Thompson and Von Neider of helping young kids to find their way in the game because it's not... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, Mike, this is why you're so indispensable. You, you Like Jeff said, you can bridge the gap from, from Peter Thompson to Sylvia Ballesteros to Tiger Woods to... You know the, the the modern architecture, like it, it's uh, it's quite a, a golfing life you've had. Yeah, it's been a you know it's well, I've loved it. It's been a wild ride, really. It all started because I, you know, my parents bought a house at the back of a golf course that no longer exists. They sold it for houses, but we jumped the fence to caddy just to make some money, really. So it's a it's a it's a pitting caddying's gone out of the game in Australia. But um, yeah, it's been a you know. You know, golf, golf finds you really like, more than we find it almost. But it's a cool game. You know, it's been an amazing game to be involved in, and just you know, I can't believe the people I've met. Really, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, I caddied for I caddied for a friend of mine at the Will's Masters in 1975, Victoria, and he played with Norman von Neider. And then when I turned pro, John Kelly and I, who won the Australian Amateur as well, we went and stayed with Norman von Neider for a week at Corelban, and he kind of taught us and played with us and. Here I was, like in awe of Norman, Norman von Neider, and six years later, I'm sneaking my girlfriend into the flat. So uh, after he'd gone to sleep, and who, who's now <laughs> my wife, and yeah, you know, but I mean, you know, I think that I mean, having got to know von in, in the years after that, I mean, the last thing Norman von Neider would have cared about was me sneaking my girlfriend into the into the house after he'd gone to sleep. You know, I mean, he'd have been full of encouragement for that sort of behaviour, but um. <laughs> God, he was such a legend, Norman von Neider. What a player he was. Wow. I think he's still got the record for most number of tournaments won in Europe in a single year. So he was, you know, he was a he was a god in Australia. That's a good bit of trivia. You could make some money the week of the open in the in the pubs there, asking yeah. asking the, the fans yeah. that uh, question. Norman, Norman von well, Neider, yeah. 
Alan, can I get one more? Can I get one more in here? Of course. I was just going to yeah. yeah, last call. Let's yeah, hear it. For both you guys, when you work together, uh, are you very much on the same page? Do you have different ways of looking at uh, at golf holes and what a golf course should be? Um, well, I think that having both grown up at Royal Melbourne, Jeff is a caddy and living on the course and me is just you know, someone who played it lots. We And we both love St Andrews, so we all see the same things, I think. You know, and, and Mackenzie was, you know, he was transferring the sort of golf you had to play at on, on the old course. He transferred that around the world. He certainly took it to Augusta and he took it to Royal Melbourne. So I think we all sort of see that, that same sort of the way the game is played at the old course and how, how it plays out and the choices you have to make. I think Jeff and I both see the, see the game the same way. Because Royal Melbourne was such an influence on us as kids and when you go to the old course and you play there, you know, this all makes sense now. So I think we both see the same sort of things really. That makes sense, Jeff? I think it's completely true. I think we see it the same. I think it's uh, nice to have two different generations too where I'm seeing 310 yards off the tee and you're seeing 250. Um, And you just sort of getting because the philosophy works at any length really you know solid architecture Royal Melbourne would be fine shorter or longer it doesn't really matter I mean that's why Tiger's the best player there in 2019 because even though he's hitting it 40 yards further than Seve was in 1982 it still plays right the right spot's still the right spot you know and the right shot's still the right shot and it's still it still needs the old course Royal Melbourne Augusta you still need to be one of the very 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 best golfers in the world to sort of exploit and play it properly, you know, and that's just golf is more interesting. It's more depth that way than just simple hit it here and hit it here, you know. So I think both of us are very fortunate to grow up like around such incredible architecture, you know, because everywhere you go, golf is not quite as good except for just a few. There's just a few select places in the world where it's as good as Royal Melbourne, but not many, you know. So we had very fortunate education just by Geography, really. Proof of how great Royal Melbourne was, I thought, was Lydia Ko playing the Australian Open there. How she took that thing apart and won by seven shots or something. And Stacey Lewis was complaining that Royal Melbourne didn't reward good shots, which was exactly right. It only rewards great shots. But Lydia was just, this was pre her going to see Ledbetter in the A swing. But, you know, as great as watching Seve and Tiger play Royal Melbourne, as interesting was watching the best woman in the world and how she got her way around that course and how she figured out how to play it and the shot she hit. And that was just as fascinating. It was amazing. So um, she was, is great. She's back at number one right now. She, is she number one in the world again? She is. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she made it back and, you know, she's not with Ledbetter anymore and she's kind of gone back a little to her roots and her old, older swing and, I think she's gearing up for another big run, which would be delightful. But yeah, you're right. That's an overlooked victory when people talk about her just pure genius. Like the way she, she I remember that week. That was that was incredible stuff. Um, but not many top ten, not many courses let would let that happen. You know, Royal Melbourne and the old course, Augusta probably not so much off the tees we play, but. Um, Anyone, it's there for everybody. It doesn't matter what length you hit it. Um, Royal Melbourne has the similar challenge. You get the same shots and you get every opportunity. If you hit good shots at your length, you can play Royal Melbourne. You know, it's not – length is proportionately rewarded, not disproportionately. I mean, imagine Beth Page Black, the girls playing out there. You know, I mean, it just doesn't work, right? But Royal Melbourne, it gets better almost the shorter you hit it, you know. Um, yeah, genius. She didn't miss a shot for years, did she? She looks like she's back to where she was. Yeah, she's fantastic. Yeah, she was just an amazing player. I mean, she was almost the best player in the world at 15. When she, once you win the Canadian Open at 15, I mean, it was phenomenal how great a player she is. <laughs> That's good stuff. All right, before before we let Mike go, do you have any any parting thoughts, Jeff? No, at all. He's uh, giving you guys a few stories you haven't heard. Um, <laughs> yeah, more than a few. Um, 
No, nah, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. No, it was good. We couldn't that do it. Fun. We couldn't do it without you, the 79th most important person in golf <laughs> on our podcast. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's trending. He's trending. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, Mike. Well, if you all see right. the little red phone icon at the bottom, click that. We, we have a tradition of our guest leaves and then we talk about them behind their back. So we're going right. to carry okay. that on. I'll still do that. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for your time. It was, it was a great pleasure. Mike Clayton. What a gent. Yeah, I'm telling you, like, uh, golf trivia night between Bamberger and Clayton would be interesting. Um, <laughs> there's not obscure, many golf facts that he doesn't know. Obscure European tour players from the early 80s, like that, that's their sweet spot. That's why I interviewed a guy the other day. He, he'd read a, he's written a book about Johnny McDermott, and he, he, he's Irish himself, the, uh, the author of the book. And we talked for 30 minutes. And then the guy wrote me a note. He said, I haven't talked to anybody for 30 minutes on the phone since high school. I'm like, 30 minutes is nothing. But here we are an hour 15 with Mike Clayton. And literally, we did not scratch the surface of what he knows about the game, what he feels about the game, the fact that he still needs to play every day, the golf courses that he snuck onto, let alone the courses he played legitimately. I mean, he's led such a rich golfing life. And when he talks about Peter Thompson as a polymath, He's, well, Peter Thompson definitely was the polymath, the polymaths probably. But Mike Clayton's right there too. And Jen Stevenson's name didn't even come up. He genuinely plays golf. He genuinely plays golf every day. I don't, I cannot remember a day when he plays golf every day. And he would travel. If he went somewhere for golf, he would take his golf clubs before his clothes. Like it's clubs first, clothes optional, you know, like. Fantastic. And talk about golf. He can talk about anything. Like he talks about anything intelligent. He's very well read. Um, as you said, he's probably read every golf book ever written twice, you know, some of them 10 times. He just, uh, just, it's just a lifetime passion for, for a game, right? Incredible. I interviewed him about Greg Norman for this, this live book that I'm writing. And, and he was recounting on top of his head all kinds of old tournaments and details and shots and scores. And I went back and looked them all up. He was right about every single number and every single detail. It was uncanny. I mean, stuff from the 70s, like just an incredible mind for it. But let's get back to Jan Stevenson. What's that story? No, it's just, you know, icon of the game that... I thought this might be like shades of Norm Van Nita's uh, flat sneaking in, but now I'm disappointed. Uh, um, Jeff, the uh, you know as as Mike represented as Peter Thompson did as Adam Scott does that unpretentious spirit of the Australian golfer is one of the richest things uh, in the game. As you've gotten to know some of these younger players coming up, you know with the Sandbelt the Invitational and other things that you do, um, is there any jeopardy of of golf of Australian golf losing that spirit, or are you seeing it in the next generation? No, I think that's a bit of a trait of all Aussies, to be honest. We all sort of – it's good and it's bad, right? It, it keeps everybody sort of unassuming and it keeps egos in check, but it also probably – it's a little negative too. Sometimes we chop down our stars a little bit, bring them back to earth. Aussie, your mates are always bringing you back to earth. Um, they're not letting get you get, not letting, letting get ahead, of yourself, ahead of yourself too much. Whereas, like you, you go to the U.S., the newspapers make every golfer seem like just an unbelievably great golfer. Here, even the best player is getting bagged because he bogeyed the 17th hole on Saturday and he really should have been two in front instead of one in front. That really wasn't a very good effort, you know, whereas in the US, it's like, how good is this golf tournament? What an unbelievable chance for these guys to play, you know? So it's just a different perspective we have, but it keeps everybody being a pretty decent bloke, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, look at Cam and Leishman and Scotty. I mean, and they're all pretty... Um, they're good humans to be around no matter what they've done in the game. You know, they're, I mean, Scotty's been incredible since he's won the Masters. He's been back to Australia every year. There's been tournaments. He plays more than he needs to at, in this modern world's a massively discounted rate. He basically comes because he just, he knows, like Clay says, like Tomo used to do, golf needs, in Australia, golf needs Adam Scott to come play. And he feels that and he does it, you know, and most of the Aussies are like that. So, um, I think that side of things is all their mates. If you grow up around Australians very long, they'll keep you in your place. <laughs> <laughs> Voice of experience.
Well, and he's what a mentor, just talking from mentoring, but just mentoring on a higher level. He's like sort of like the godfather of Australian golf a little bit. Like he's um, the one you ask if you've got any questions. And he, to this day, is playing golf. These are all these days he plays golf. He's playing golfers with juniors, kids, anybody who loves golf, he'll play with them. You know, girls, guys, kids, grown-ups, old people. He just plays golf. If you're into golf, he'll go play with them. So there's... He's had an incredible influence across sort of the elite golf landscape um, since he came back from Europe. So he came back from Europe, I think, in the – I think he stopped playing Europe sort of 96, 97, 98 sort of thing, maybe 98. And ever since then, he's just been floating around Australia playing golf at golf courses and good golfers have been attracted to sort of playing with him and he's the, the wisdom and uh, experience and sort of pragmatic – no nonsense way he goes about explaining golf to these people. It's a little bit like Tomo. I mean, Tomo was there's only one Tomo. Tomo made a complicated thing very, very simple. Um, he made he Peter Peter Fowler. Just a quick story about Tomo. Peter Fowler was a great young Australian player. Ended up playing well, still playing seniors tour in Europe and stuff. But he won the Australian Open, I think, in 1983 or 82, 83. Um, and he was about to head off to Europe or something, and he calls Peter and. He goes, oh, Peter, I really want to have a good year in Europe and I want to sort of play well and I just really think I need to get better and what what do you think I need to do to be a better professional golfer? Tomo said, shoot lower scores. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> but fundamentally, when you, I, and you just think that's ridiculous. How rude is that? That's not a very good lesson. But the longer I've played golf, the more I realize that that's actually the only lesson you ever. Just go and work out how to shoot lower scores. Um that's how simple he viewed golf. It's like, well, if you're not going very well, just have have a few shots less, and you'll be doing better. You know, fantastic. And Clayton's is <laughs> a little bit, a little bit like he's a little bit like that with these guys. He doesn't let them complicate it. They keep it simple. Um, and if you spend any time around him, you'll like golf more at the end of the day than you do at the start. You can't end it any better than that. So, uh, great stuff. Um, all right. Well, this has been another uh, Nita Fourth, uh, Mike Clayton, fantastic guest. We have we have more coming. So, thanks for listening. Um, I'm going to sign off for Michael Bamberg or Jeff Ogilvie and Mike Clayton. This is Alan Shipnuck, but we appreciate you being part of this podcast out there, wherever you are, and uh, uh, we'll we'll keep bringing them to you. That's the end. Oh my God, there's a dangerous group here. Ha, ha, ha.